Thank you very much for coming, folks. I appreciate it. My name is Thomas Cameron. Uh, I am the Red Hat practice lead at Sparksoft Corporation. We're a company in the D.C. area who serves the federal government, specifically around health care. So uh, if you're familiar with healthcare.gov, we are one of the contractors on healthcare.gov. So we do a whole, all kinds of stuff with, uh, gosh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, National Institutes of Aging, Nas National Institutes of Health, and stuff like that. So even though I work with the federal government, we do good stuff around healthcare, so, so don't hold it against me. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking today about enterprise automation with AWX, and we'll talk about what that is in a little while. Uh, AWX is the upstream project from which Red Hat builds the product Ansible automation platform. So I'm going to talk about kind of kind of how to get familiar with AWX because um, AAP, there are trials available, but it's kind of a pain and they expire after 60 days. So I want to show you how to get it up and running in your environment so that you can become familiar with Ansible automation platform because it's a hugely valuable uh, skill set to have. Uh, lots of folks are moving towards uh, Ansible for automation. In fact, to get your RHCE exam, uh, you have to, <laughs> it, it irritates me because like, it, they teach you nothing about like the underlying technologies like the NFS server or DHCPD or any of that stuff. But boy, they will show you how to write Ansible playbooks for automating those things, which I've always thought was a little bit weird. But, so, um, let's talk about what we're going to be talking about. The agenda is that we're going to do look, a quick introduction. I'm going to talk about what AWX is, the architecture, the installation, logging in, building your organizations, adding your users, uh, setting up credentials, setting up a simple project just to test connectivity to make sure that your machines are responding and you have your SSH credentials set up and correctly and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and then, so we'll set up the project, we'll ping, we'll set up your inventory, just like with Ansible, you know how you have to have a, an inventory file, similar concept, but we're doing it server-based instead of on a per uh, playbook uh, uh, perspective. We'll talk about how to set up SSH, set up the, your credentials so that you can log into the man, uh, machines that you manage. Uh, and then I will talk to you about what a template is. Um, and then I'll set up another project for Apache Web Server. And then I'll set up another project for MariaDB uh, with a goal at the end of showing you what it looks like in the real world when you use AAP or AWX to run uh, configs on your environment. So uh, time permitting, I'll do a live demo at the end. I think everything should be fine because I spun up all my VMs, and it does take a little while to spin up your AAP or your uh, AWX VM because it's got to spin up Kubernetes, it's got to do all the networking and stuff like that, so it does take a little bit uh, of time. Now, just a little bit of information about me, just so that you understand uh, why I'm talking about what I'm talking about. So as I said, I'm Thomas, uh, he, him pronouns. Um, I have been doing this since 1993. How many folks are under 31 years old? Oh, God. <laughs> All right. So I've been doing this literally longer than some of y'all have been alive. Um, I started out, and I'm dating myself, as a Novell certified netware engineer back in the days where you could run a server on a 386 or a 486. Then I went to work for Microsoft. Don't hold it against me. Um, during the Windows 95 launch, and that's, uh, I became a Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer. Then I went to work for Red Hat. Spent about 14 years there. Uh, was a Red Hat Certified Architect, plus a whole bunch of specialty certifications around security and performance tuning and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, I got recruited by AWS. Uh, went there for about four years and got all of the certs from uh, there as well. So SA Associate, Security Specialist, SA Pro, and so on and so forth. And generally by the time I get done telling people all the stuff that I've done, the answer is like, <laughs> you don't get out much, do you? Because I spend a lot of time doing nerd stuff, uh, and that's cool because uh, it, it, it works for me with my ADHD. You know, you hear people talking about the, the superpower of ADHD. You can hyper-focus on stuff, and there have been times where my wife 
has come in going, I'm getting up for the day. Have you been to bed yet? So yeah, it's, it's a good thing to, to be a nerd with ADHD. So my contact information is up there. Don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, if it's community stuff, like what I'm doing here, which I absolutely love doing, uh, my email address and my, uh, my website are on there. Um, if you want to talk to me professionally, you've also got my work email address. So whatever makes sense, uh, I'm available. So, as my daughter likes to say, Dad, you woke up and chose violence. I'm going to ask you all some questions. I want to get the blood flowing. I want to get the juices going. I have a question for you. How do you pronounce this? How about, any, raise your hand if you say sis, system cuddle. Okay, system CTL. Okay, cool. How about this one? Same? If it's cube cuddle, no? Okay. So cube CTL, all right, cool. What do you call this? Is it K8S or is it Kate's? You call it Kate's. Really, okay, cool. And then finally, <laughs> is it K3S or is it K3s? Keys, just keys. Okay, cool, cool. I was just curious, right? Because I, you know, like I've seen some people call it, you know, cube cuddle, and a lot of people call it cube CTL, and I was just curious, like, if that was just me. Now, finally, oh, no, never mind. I don't ever even want to bring that up. <laughs> All right, cool. So let's move in to the meat of the subject. Let's talk about what AWX is. So AWX, as I said, is the... Um, upstream for Ansible Automation pl uh, Platform. Uh, and this is literally from uh, Red Hat's website, uh, or the, the AWX website. And it basically just says, hey, this is where we put stuff out into the community, and this is one of the things that I love about Red Hat. That's why I went to work for them, uh, is that they do, they really try to take an upstream first perspective. They're not always successful at it, but I genuinely believe that management's heart is in the right place. So as I said, AWX is the upstream, just like Fedora is the upstream for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, AWX is the upstream for AAP. The UI that you see with uh, AWX is the same. I mean, there are a couple of little subtle differences, but one of the things that I love about using AWX is, like I said, you get the experience, you can play around with it, you can learn kind of the foibles and stuff like that, uh, and uh, you're not having to pay for an expensive subscription or do the silly like, oh, I gotta come up with a new email address for another 60-day evaluation. Not that we would ever do that, right? Right? Okay, all right, so very high level 10,000 foot overview of the architecture because you could spend like two, two weeks talking about this. In fact, if you take the uh, 394 uh, test from Red Hat, it is literally like 40 something, 48 hours of training if you do the Red Hat online training. So, I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot to it. But the 10,000 foot overview is, it is Kubernetes based. There are a number of options. You can do K3S or K, what did you call it? Oh. Keys, keys, okay. Um, so you can use keys, uh, you can use Minikube, but don't. Um, you can even use OpenShift. There are a number of ways that you can do it. Um, and basically what it does is there are containers for job management, there are containers for the engine for AWX itself, there are containers for the UI, uh, so, uh, there are even containers for Postgres, if you so desire. You can actually tell um, uh, AWX to use an external database. That's totally cool as well, just whatever, whatever uh, makes sense. But for what I want to talk about here, which is basically like just getting up and running and, and used to it, you can just let it build the, uh, the Postgres containers. And again, this 10,000 foot overview, this is an advanced architectural diagram so you can have you know the automation hub you can have the EDA controller you can have the automation controller itself uh, you can connect to external databases like it can get really big and really complex uh, but 
again, with AWX, it's really kind of designed more for just getting familiar with the technology. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to take a really simple view in this session where we're just going to do it on a single node machine and, and play around with it. So, <laughs> like I said, AWX, um, there is a how-to in the AWX uh, Git, GitHub repo. It's terrible. Don't do it. it it's seriously, it's painful. Um, and I'll talk about what I ran into. So, but for single node, um, <laughs> I tried on Fedora 39. I tried on CentOS Stream 9. I did one successful installation doing the Minikube, and I did one successful installation using the Docker Compose, uh, you know, in the, in the developer thing, like three weeks ago. And I was like, this is going to be great, man, you know, because, I mean, it worked all the way through. And then they revved the operator, and then they revved uh, AWX, and it was awful. Everything broke. And so I struggled to get a working setup. I literally did not get my final slides done till last night because it was just failing and failing and failing. And I was seriously at the point where I was like, I may have to just cancel this talk because I couldn't get the demo to work. I finally settled on um, using CentOS uh, Stream 8, and that seems to be the most stable build, and using the, the keys installation like just worked, so that's what I did. Um, I used uh, Kurokobo's keys method, uh, method um, I, I tried using the AW, uh, AWX operator as it was described in the how-to, and Minikube just, it would come up and then hang. And I it never would, and I was looking at logs, I couldn't figure out what was causing it, so I fought with that. Tried it on CentOS 9, same thing. Uh, then I tried the Docker Compose developers build, and <laughs> it wouldn't build the containers. It would throw errors about, you know, Postgres file systems, uh, and that wouldn't work. And I was starting to get a little bit panicky there. Uh, and then I was finally on the Matrix channel for AWX, and uh, somebody was like, dude, just use Kurokobo's Kura um, keys build. It works. And I tried it on Fedora, and it crashed, and I tried it on CentOS Stream 9, and it crashed, and I finally was like, oh my gosh, I, I'm cursed. This is never going to work. But it said in his documentation, I have tested this on CentOS Stream 8, and so I was like, all right, I have, I have tried all my best thinking, and it didn't work. Uh, so what I did was I did a super minimal installation of CentOS Stream 8, uh, to give you an idea, like if you do, uh, if, if you look at my DNF group list, like you see everything is labeled as available. It was a super minimal installation. Nothing, nothing installed. The only thing that I installed was at base and at core. That was it. Uh, so only about a 576 RPMs. Now, um, if you go look at the URL, and y'all can have this slide deck. I will post it as a PDF on my website. Um, but uh, if you go look at the GitHub repo, um, you can dig down into the README, and it talks about, you know, we're going to use the slash data directory. Uh, you're going to set your passwords for both AWX and Postgres, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I was like, okay, cool. And then I read down, and it was like, I tested it on CentOS Stream 8, and I was like, okay, message received, and I, and I did it on CentOS Stream 8. Now... Um, Interestingly, it does use a slightly old version, but just like one, like a few revs back of uh, keys. Um, and it does use an older operator. Uh, the 2.13.0 dropped last week. And uh, as soon as you shut down your, <laughs> your cluster, uh, it deleted the storage for the Postgres server. <laughs> so that was something I was f fighting with. They did come out, come out with 2.13.1, but even that one, somebody else on the Matrix channel was saying, I can't get my containers to build. And so again, I, I came back to this documentation. He's like, 2.12 is the way to go. And so that's what I did. Uh, and it, it uses an old version of Postgres, but it works. Uh, and so 
Now, I also looked at the requirements, two CPUs with four gigs of memory, uh, 10 gigs for Varlig Lib Rancher, 10, gig, uh, 10 gigs for data, so I made sure that those were both there. Uh, and so, you know, again, CentOS Stream uh, made sure that I had 24 gigs of memory because I was like, no, I want to make sure this thing's going to run and compile and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, it says you got to have four cores. I might have gone a little bit overboard, 16 cores for this VM, uh, and uh, made sure that, again, Barlib Rancher and Data both had, I think, 20 gigs of space, and so I was good to go. Now, the deployment instructions tell you to do something which hurts my heart a lot. Uh, they tell you to disable Firewall D. Anyone ever seen my SE Linux for Mere Mortals presentation? Yeah. So, security guy, like, you want me to do what? But I did it. Uh, and then it has you remove some stuff just to make sure that it's, or to uh, turn off some stuff, and then install uh, Git and curl. So, again, I hate this advice. In the real world, I would probably, you know, make sure that I set my firewall rules up, but for this, uh, for this demo, I went ahead and did uh, system control disable firewall D, uh, make sure that those services are turned off if these, these are cloud instances, uh, and then I made sure that I had git and curl installed. That was installed, we're, li we're good, and in the instructions it said reboot, and I was like, you know what? I am cursed, so I'm going to do what the instructions said. And I rebooted the machine, and it seemed to be just fine. So uh, I totally understand why it installs this way, but I'm just curious, does anyone else hate mixing packaged pa uh, software and stuff like flat packs and snaps and all that stuff? Because, yes, I really want three different distribution mechanisms to manage my 10,000 servers, right? I hate that. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at you, Snap and Flatpak and all those guys. Uh, but, so, then it talks about installing uh, uh, keys. And the way that you do that is you use curl, pipe it to bash. I hate that. But, again, we're doing this for a demo. Uh, and so, uh, I ran the command. Uh, one of the things you want to remember is make sure you tell it what the mode is for the config file. Uh, because by default it's 600 and it's owned by root and as a regular user you can't read the file and you can't start your uh, uh, cluster. So uh, make sure you do that. Uh, it, it will then create a bunch of sim links uh, including there's a, a kill all script, uh, there's the service file that it gets, uh, that, it get, that it generates and then does system control enable. So that's kind of nice. Uh, that means that when you reboot the machine, all your services come up and it actually works as expected. So that was really cool. Um, and then once I ran the installer, I mean, it, it installed pretty quick, right? And I was like, oh, cool, it's up and running. And I did uh, kubectl git nodes. And I was like, okay, yeah, it's up. But then I remembered, oh, yeah, no, it's got to spin up all the, all the pods. And so you could see that for the first several minutes, it took probably 10 minutes uh, for my machine to come up. Um, you could see that it was doing container creation. Um, I use watch with a 10 second uh, uh, delay, and I just ran it until everything was either up or completed and expected. So I was like, okay, cool. It's up and running. We're in good shape. The next step is I need to use AWX operator. And the way that we do that is you got to do git clone, you got to go to the directory, check out the correct version, uh, and then uh, run some commands. So I created a git directory, went to that git directory, did a git clone. Once I did the git clone, uh, I did the uh, git checkout 212.2. That worked just fine. Uh, and then the instructions say, now we just use kubectl-k uh, uh, operator. And so I ran that command. And one of the things I love about this guy's documentation is it says these are the commands you can run to check and make sure that everything's working. So you kind of get to follow along and make sure that things are working the way expected. So um, I did kubectl-apply-k operator. And you see all of these things that got created. And uh, again, the nodes were, uh, that was already up, uh, but I did get pods, and you can see that again, you know, it's doing container builds, so you gotta wait for a little while. You can watch CPU utilization on your machine. And then after a little while, uh, and I, I used watch again, and after a few minutes, 
all of my processes, everything was done, and my machine was up and running. Uh, and so then it even says, like, you can look and see all of the, you know, everything. You do uh, kubectl n awx get all, and it shows you your uh, pods, it shows what services, the deployment apps, it shows all of this stuff, and so you can watch and see that it's okay. And uh, then you need to make some customization for your site. Uh, so you go in and first and foremost, and I love this about, about uh, this, this repo, is he's like, let's go ahead and do this using SSL on port 443. We're just going to use a, uh, a self-signed certificate so you get the warning, but like you don't have to go, oh, I'm going to connect to port 30870 or something like that. You just go to the web server and it's good to go. So it has you set an environment variable, run your open SSL command, uh, and then you have to make some changes in the AWX YAML file. Uh, and so I did that. Um, first and foremost, though, I wanted to make sure that DNS resolution was working the way that I was expecting, and I found that I had done something silly. Uh, you know, when you're using DNS mask, when you define your IP addresses in your Etsy hosts file, whatever the first field after your IP address uh, that's what it assigns as a host name. And I had forgotten that. And so I had a little shell script that was like, you know, 4i and 1 through uh, 254 do echo host or the IP address and then host dollar i and then host dollar i dot virtual dot lan, which is what I use for that. And it screwed up my DNS uh, uh, resolution in my virtual network because everybody was like, oh, my host name is host123 instead of host123.virtual.lan. And it did screw up something that I was trying to demo. So just be aware of that. So I made sure that you know, DNS is working. It worked forward, reverse. Uh, everything was resolvable. And then uh, I said, you know, I, I used the command that it said. So I did AWX host is my host name. And once I made sure that that, set, that was set, then I ran the OpenSSL command so that I got the self-signed certificate. It wrote it out into a key file so that I could use for my uh, web server. Uh, and then, yeah, I know I'm putting a, a key on there. This is the key for my virtual network in KVM. So like steal it, I don't care, unless you get physical access to my machine, uh, I, whatever. Um, so then it talks about you have to customize your uh, awx.yaml file. And it's a pretty simple fix. So you go and you see that the default is awx.example.com. I knew that I was going to be using host209.virtual.lan, so I just edited the file, uh, made that change. And then it talks about you have to change the password if you want to in your customization.yaml file. Uh, and so I did. I went and I edited it. Um, that's the file. It's under base. Uh, you can see that it had the default password, which is Ansible123, Ansible123. I just edited it, and I came up with a silly, you know, 20 Sparksoft 24, bang. Uh, and I did that in both places. Uh, one is the password for the uh, Postgres database. The other one is for the login. So I made those changes. It talks you through making directories. We've all done that, right? So I just, uh, I did want to show you though, in the pv.yaml file, the per persistent volume YAML file, you can see that it sets the claim up, allocates eight gigs uh, in Postgres 1.3, and then the other one is the persistent volume uh, for uh, slash data slash projects. Uh, it'll use two gigs of that space. Uh, so I made that. Uh, I did those things, I created those directories, I set the ownership per the instructions in there. One thing that I will point out is, it says to do chown 1000. If your UID is not 1000, don't do that. Like, use your UID so that you own that directory. Uh, but I did that, I checked the permissions, everything was good. And then finally it says go ahead and uh, do kubectl apply dash k based. Uh, base and I did and then it talks about some commands that you can run to see the progress of your build uh, and I did that and I'll show you what that looks like so I ran kubectl apply dash k based uh, base and it started all of those uh, uh, containers and I watched the log files 
and uh, man, it took like 15 minutes. And I've got a fairly beefy laptop. It's fairly new. It's got like 12th gen, I think, Intel. Like it's a pretty snappy machine. And it still took a while. So watch the log file because nothing's more exciting than watching a log file scrolling by. Uh, but it also talks about, you know, uh, some things that you could do. So I would watch, you know, kubectl uh, get pods dash A, and you could see what was, you know, coming up, and you could see what was in the AWX namespace. Uh, watch that for a little while, came back to the log files, because it was still scrolling by. Open another shell, uh, did um, get pods, and you could see that, you know, there were a bunch of them that hadn't started up yet. Uh, looked at, or I just did a, a watch command on the uh, uh, cube cuddle um, in the namespace of AWX, and I just watched it. And after a few minutes, it finally converted over, and you saw everything was up and running. Uh, I was able to do uh, get get pods dash A, and I could see that um, initially, you know, everything was initializing. After about 10 minutes, uh, it came over to where everything was running, or it had completed and exited. And uh, then once I was sure that it was done, I could use uh, kubectl dash n awx, and you could look at uh, everything, basically, your, your um, all ingress, secrets, all that kind of good stuff. And so again, this just shows you that yes, everything came, uh, came up, it'll tell you what port numbers are exposed, uh, it'll tell you, you know, uh, whether your deployment apps have completed. So this is, it was, it was pretty cool. The instructions, like I said, uh, were really good for this uh, keys deployment. Um, so did that, finally went back to the, uh, to the command where I was watching the log file, and this is the thing that you care about. When you see the recap at the end, you just want to make sure that failed is set to zero. It will skip a bunch of stuff based on what your architecture looks like. That's cool. As long as you don't have anything failed, then boom, the system is up and running. Now, whoo, spent all this time trying to figure all this stuff out, and uh, then we were able to log in and start using things. And that's where kind of where the meat of it is. So went to connect, same as you've always seen, it's self-signed certificate, it says, hey, this is not to be trusted, okay, whatever, thank you, Google. Um, login using the username and password that you, or the password that you define, the login is admin, um, and then you get the dashboard. And you can start poking around in there, there's a lot of neat stuff, uh, but we're gonna talk about sort of the minimum necessary things that you need to do to start playing around with the UI. So the first thing that I did was, I don't know if you can see it up here, I went to help about, and it says that it is 23.9.0, which is the latest version of the build. I went to the AWX repo, and sure enough, the last stable version was 23.9.0. So cool, got the latest version, good to go. Now, once you're logged in, what you need to do is start to set up what you want your environment to look like. Uh, so what you could do is you can set up your uh, organizations first, and the way that you do that is pretty straightforward. Um, you just go over here under access, go to organizations. There's a default organization. I do recommend that you not just use the default organization. It's kind of one of those best practice things. Like you may, oops, you may be in an environment where I know for sure we're never, ever, ever going to have another organization. Sure. <laughs> what? Somebody squeaked. <laughs> We're not all staring at you or anything, I promise. Uh, so, go ahead and define the organization. Don't just use the default. So, I go in. It's real simple. Click on add. Uh, put in the name of the organization. I work for Sparksoft, so I made an organization called Sparksoft. I gave it a nice, pretty description. And, and that's it. Boom. You've defined the organization. Now everything that you do will be associated with that, with that organization, all your user accounts and stuff like that. If at some point down the road, all of a sudden you acquire a company or you get acquired or something like that because you've already set up your organization, you're not as likely to run into the oh no moment where, oh, I gotta burn it down and start over from scratch. 
it's not a huge it's not a huge deal. Um, generally, what you'll do is you'll you'll have to do a little bit of work. You'll have to basically uh, create new inventories and create you know new users and stuff like that in the new organization. Um, but beyond that, if like if you have a really super complex build, you're probably going to have a bad day. Um, you, because because there's so much stuff that gets poked into the do, the database, like your users and your uh, uh, credentials and and stuff like that, you, you're you're probably gonna have a tough time with it. So try to if you can just build your organization, you know, from the from the outset. If you did the default organization, can you rename that to a named organization? Ooh, I don't think I've ever tried because I always just ignore the default and create a new one. I. I don't know. I don't know. I'll play around with it. I'm going to do a demo in a little while. We'll take a look. I don't know. Um, all right. Now, now that you've defined the uh, organizations, you got to create users. Pretty straightforward. You go into the UI, go over under access, go to users. There is the default admin user. Just click on add. Uh, you'll get a form that looks like this. You're going to put in name, you know, first name, last name, email address, uh, the username. You could define the password. And here is where you have the opportunity to set access levels, right? Uh, do we want to do a, a normal user where you're going to have to explicitly be granted permissions over an org or over a work group or something like that? Uh, do you want to be a system administrator, which means you have, you know, godlike privileges or you even have the ability to have a system auditor type of account. So someone can go in and take a look at what you've done, but they can't make any changes. So set all that up. Make sure you assign it to the correct uh, organization. Life is good. Lather, rinse, and repeat for all the people in your organization or in your IT team, right? Pretty straightforward. Uh, so when you get done, you'll see the users in there. Life is good. Now, this one... Like, it took a little while for me to wrap my head around what we were talking about here. You can set up, and this is, I think, I, I don't know if I would say it's a UI bug, but it's kind of weird. When you go to credentials, you have the ability to define credentials for outbound communications, like to GitHub or, you know, any of the... Um, uh, registries that you want to attach to, but you also use credentials for inbound communications to the systems that you manage. And the first time I was like, shouldn't that be too different? But eh, we're going to go with it. So in this case, I have a GitHub repo. If y'all look at my GitHub repo, I'm not a developer. Understand this. My YAML code is ugly. I know it. You know it. Everybody knows it. Please don't say, oh my God, dude, what were you thinking? All right. So what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to set up so that I can pull stuff from GitHub. Now, my repo is public, but there are a lot of people who have private repos, and you, know, you, you can't just do an HTTPS connection to them. You, you have to use SSH. So let me show you what that looks like. So I'm going to go into my credentials. I'm going to click on Add, and I'm going to say what it's called, I'm going to put a description in it. In this case, this is Thomas's GitHub repo. You know, it could be my corporate repo, whatever. Assign it to the organization. Choose the type. There's a huge drop down that talks about all kinds of different types, whether it's like upstream uh, uh, repositories for containers or whatever. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to say it's a source control repo. I'm going to get the username and password that I log in with. And the, uh, I have to put my private key into AWX or AAP. Now, I recommend that you create a separate private key that's not like anything that you use anywhere else for just for security standpoint, right? So uh, if you have a, um, an SSH uh, password for the, uh, uh, or a passphrase I should say, um, just put it into there. Then down at the bottom, or no, that's it, uh, th then you, uh, you set that up. We'll test it in a minute, but this is basically saying if I want to be able to SSH into a private repo on GitHub or whatever, this is the, pri the private key that it's going to use, then you have to upload the public key to GitHub, but it's public key. You can put it, do, any, do anything you want with it. So I've got that credential set up. We're going to come back to credentials in a little while. 
Um, now, what I'm going to do is just to test to make sure that all of these moving parts are, are not you know, grinding any gears, uh, I'm just going to set up like a really simple Ansible ping. Um, and so what I've done is uh, I have to define a project. The project is going to be what is used to go fetch that content. So I'm going to find my SSH URL um, or my SSH command to grab my Ansible ping uh, repository. And then I'm going to go into create a new project, give it a name, give it a description, assign it to the organization. And I'm sorry, this is small. I did 19. Uh, or, yeah, 1900 by 1280 or whatever it is, but I should have made my fonts larger. I apologize for that. But assign it to the uh, organization, tell it what type of source control it is. In this case, it's Git. Here is the source control URL, which is actually just a, a login. Um, if, uh, yeah, and, and I chose the source control credential as being the type GitHub. Uh, and there are some check marks that you could do down here, like um, do I want to clean out the old version before I pull a new one, or do I want to just delete the old version? Uh, there's a bunch of things you could do. For the most part, unless you really know what you're doing, like you can leave it blank. Just read the context uh, uh, sensitive help. You can click on the little link next to it, and it'll explain those to, to you. Uh, and when you complete that, it's really important that you see that right here it says that it's running the sync. It's going and fetching that stuff from GitHub. You got to wait till that turns green and says that it was complete. Otherwise, you have a problem with your authentication or something like that. Uh, but uh, after a couple of seconds, that'll turn from running to successful. When you see the green, you're good. You have pulled your content from GitHub. And there it shows up. Yep, there's Thomas's Ansible ping project. This is the project is where you go and get your uh, content, your playbooks. Now, just like in Ansible, when we have an inventory file, right? You have to have an inventory file that's going to have, you know, your host names and maybe you can group them together into web servers or database servers or dev QA and prod or whatever. We can do the same thing, but we don't have to do an inventory file. We just define the inventory inside of AAP or in this case, AWX. So what machines do I want to run this ping test on? Well, I'm going to set it up. I'm going to go to inventories over here under resources and you're basically just filling out the inventory the the systems you want to be associated with you know whatever it is you're doing so I'm gonna click on add choose add inventory give it a name in this case I said this is all of my WordPress servers this is the database servers this is the back end uh, uh, I'm sorry the the back end database servers the front end web servers whatever so I give it that associate it with my organization and that's really all you need to do. Then, once you've defined the inventory group, then you're going to come over here to hosts, and you're going to start adding hosts to that inventory, just like if you had edited your inventory file. Uh, so I'm going to say I've got host 183, and then I'm going to add uh, host 120, uh, because 120 was my database server, and 183 was my uh, web server. So I put both of those in there. Now I've got an inventory for that one thing, for my, my ping test, right? Once I've got the inventory defined, now there is a, a break that I want to make. Y'all probably know this, but I just want to make sure that it's really clear. You have to set up SSH, right? Remember that um, Ansible is going to log into your machines using SSH, so my recommendation is that you, you do uh, SSH copy ID, or what I do is when I kickstart my machines as part of the post install process, I write the authorized keys file. Uh, but um, normally, like I said, I build it with kickstarts. Um, I add that remote user, sysadmin, or Ansible, or Ansible SVC, or whatever. Um, I generally do it with no password so that no one can ever log in using a password. And I just make sure that um, I've created the uh, authorized underscore keys file in that, that service accounts directory. And the beautiful thing about that is that machine could be 
physically on the internet with no firewall rules. No one's ever going to be able to log in as that user because you haven't assigned a password. You can only log in using the SSH key. But in this example, I just want to you know, kind of go over what it looks like. So in this case, uh, we do SSH keygen. Uh, I chose ECDSA, um, created the file. Look at the permissions on it. Notice that the uh, private key is always uh, read-write for the owner only. Uh, the public key, we don't care. Anybody can have the public key. That's not a big deal. So make sure I know those permissions. Uh, then I do SSH copy ID with that uh, ECDSA key uh, over to whatever the machines are. Uh, I, and I did it on host 120, and I did it on host 183. So I made sure that those things were there. Uh, and then we're going to go back to credentials. Remember I said earlier, credentials is, you know, you could do one set of credentials for logging into GitHub, but now what we need to do is we need to tell AAP or AWX about uh, how it can log into your systems. So I'm going to go into credentials again. I'm going to add a credential. There is my private key. Again, this is on a virtual machine that I'm going to de destroy after this uh, uh, demo is done. But I get the uh, private key. I go into and create a new credential, and I called it, you know, sysadmins SSH key, give it a nice description, associate it with my organization. The credential type in this case is a machine credential. In other words, I'm logging into a, you know, an OS-based machine. There in that dropdown, there are things like network devices. There are services for doing like, uh, like info blocks and stuff like that. So there's a ton of options that are available there. But again, we only have an hour, so I just wanted to talk about kind of the, the nuts and bolts. So I defined the machine. Uh, I can also put in the sysadmin username and password. Um, in this case, like again, I don't use passwords, I only use uh, SSH keys, but you can do that. Um, I put my private key in there. Down at the bottom, you remember how in your ansible.cfg, you have to do things like what the remote user is, you have to choose whether you're gonna become or not. Uh, if you're gonna become, how are you gonna become? So, same type of deal here. Uh, we are gonna become, we're gonna use sudo, we're gonna sudo to root, uh, so just like you're used to in your ansible.config, this is just putting it in a GUI and you don't have to do a new, a new inventory for every one of your projects. Uh, so that's done. Now I have my uh, SSH key that's been defined inside of AAP or AWX, and there it is. Now I've got to set up my template. Templates are not playbooks except there really are. <laughs> really what you're doing is the, the playbook that you've checked into GitHub or whatever is gonna be downloaded and put into your, uh, your library in the AWX or AAP machine. Um, so just remember that uh, when you create your playbooks, don't do anything like, uh, like I uploaded some playbooks that I was only running against my database servers. So for the hosts, it said DB, and I tried to run it on here, and it was like, I don't know what that means, and it failed. So always set them up to be all, uh, and you can get super crazy with your playbooks. You can get really sophisticated. You can use Ansible roles. I mean, there's a bunch of cool stuff, but again, because we only have an hour, I'm gonna keep this really, really simple. So I go into my templates. I say I'm gonna add a job, a job template, give it a name, give it a description, the job type in this case is we're just going to run a command, right? Um, I can associate it with my word, uh, you know, any of my inventory groups. So in this case, I chose all of my WordPress servers, all two of them, uh, associated it with the project that I synchronized from GitHub. Uh, and I don't actually have to define an execution environment. The default execution environment that it sets up is usually fine. If you go out of your way to define other execution environments, which unfortunately is kind of out of scope for our one hour thing, uh, you would define it there, but like you can leave it blank. Um, now, something that's really cool about um, setting up a template, you get a drop down for the YAML file that you want to use. 
I'm going to come back to that and show you something that I think is kind of cool. Um, but right now, the default is it's the ping.yaml file uh, that I checked into GitHub. Um, I can associate that SSH key, the sysadmin SSH key with credentials. Um, then, down towards the bottom, even though we're just doing a ping, like I just want to make sure that Ansible is working on the uh, target machines, you could do things like, do I want to do privilege escalation for this? In other words, do I want to become root? And I checked the box and I said yes, because I want to test to make sure not just that it's pinging, but that it does privilege escalation, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, do, you, do I want to enable concurrent jobs? Absolutely yes, especially if I'm running this across you know, a thousand machines. Uh, so there's that, I save that, and now it comes back and it says, okay, it's using this playbook, ping.yaml, um, and it gives me the option to either edit the template or run the template. And so, hey, it's time, you know, it's time to test. So I click on launch. It runs just like if you ran Ansible Playbook from the command line or Ansible Navigator from the command line. This ought to look really familiar. <laughs> and so basically what it does is it runs the SSH session uh, to the target machines. And you can see that it gathers it up and it says the events uh, processing is complete. So at this point, we know that our SSH key is good. We know that we've pulled the YAML file. Like, life is good. Now, if we want to get a little bit more sophisticated, and, and this is just showing that when you get done with one of these jobs, it'll show up under jobs, and so you can go back and see. This is a great tool for if you did something wrong or if you fat-fingered something. It'll come up and it'll say, you know, it'll show you what the Ansible run uh, output is. So, there's that. Now let's get a little bit more complicated. Yes, sir. Yeah, can I make a check of, is this running under the hood? Oh, like under the hood? I don't, what's that? Um, okay, so yes, it is actually running it in a container in your Kubernetes uh, cluster. And the reason I know that is this confused me because I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed and I'm the first one to admit that. Uh, let me go back and let me, let me, let's see, where to go, where to go, hang on, let me see, whoops. Oh, it's actually in a much previous slide. So, the reason that I know that it's running in a container is when you define the project, and the project is where it goes out and actually fetches the playbooks, it says, oh, this is being stored under uh, var lib awx. I was like, ooh, I want to see what that looks like. So I logged into my AV AWX machine, and I looked, and there was no directory called varlib AWX because that runs in one of the containers that is running in the Kubernetes cluster. So what you would have to do is you'd have to use kubectl to log into the container, and then, uh, so yes, it is definitely running in a container. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. What's that? Okay. Let me finish up, and then we'll do questions at the end. All right, cool. So we did that, we did that, we did that. Um, so again, this is just the same thing, except now my playbook is a little bit more complex, right? Uh, let me show you what that looks like. So I'm gonna go in, this is a, and again, y'all, don't bust my chops for my crappy YAML. Um, so I went to my repository, uh, github.com slash tdcam, and there is my apache.yaml playbook. Uh, I went, to create a new project, because remember the project is what fetches the content. So it's Thomas's Apache installation, organization, it's a git um, source control type, there's the URL, which is actually an SSH login. Uh, I click on that, it synchronizes, so I, now I know I've got my uh, playbooks. Then I go over to the inventory, and I'm gonna create the inventory. So I create a new inventory. I say this is for the web servers. Uh, and when I fill that out, I go over here to hosts. I add my hosts. In this case, it is host183.virtual.lan. It's a VM on my uh, Linux laptop. Once I've got that done, life is good. I go over to the template. And again, the template's not really a playbook, but it kind of is a playbook because it uses the playbook that you got. Define it. I'm not going to go through all of this because you've already seen it, but it's a run job. Uh, I'm going to say it's on the web servers and it's using the uh, uh, 
playbook that it pulled down. I am going to make sure that I cho uh, choose privilege escalation and concurrent jog jobs. And I'll usually, well, sometimes I will uh, enable fact storage because you know how when Ansible does a connection, every time it does, it gathers facts about the machines. Do I want to keep that, those facts on my AWX server? More data is never a bad thing, so yeah, I do. Um, so I create it. Now, once I've created the template, I can click on the template, and this is what it looks like. So I go to the template, I click on launch, it logs into my machines, and so what I've done is um, I set up a, um, a, a DNF call, or a, a, a DNF function, uh, so I installed HTTPD and mod SSL and I think WordPress. Uh, so I made sure that those were installed. I made sure that I started the service. I opened 80 and 443. And when I get done at the end, nothing failed. So now my web server, my web tier is up and running. And so sure enough, I can go to host 183 and... Uh, Yep, it was successfully deployed. I actually, as part of the playbook, created an index.html that says successfully deployed. Um, now, this is something that I just, I'm kind of a geek, and so like I don't like leaving messes. So I actually updated my Git repo with a, I had the ap Apache install.yaml file. Well, I have an Apache remove.yaml file. And basically, I'm not going to bore you with it, but basically what it does is it goes through and it, it removes uh, HTTPD and mod SSL, turns off the firewall ports, uh, and so I can create another template for that. Or I'm sorry, uh, I can go to the existing template for that. And you remember I talked about how you've got the drop down? Well, I've got my apache.yaml, which installs everything. And then I've got my remote, uh, remove apache.yaml, which does DNF auto remove. So it's not just the package, but all the uh, dependencies and stuff like that. So I created that, run that. And so I can back out what I've done. Um, so that the machine is exactly like it was before I installed. Now, y'all know that that's a, a, a pet's approach and we're supposed to be dealing with cattle, but I just thought it was kind of fun. So there's that, uh, and after I get done, the web server's not there, so uh, all of a sudden that's, that's failed. Same thing for now the backend server. I'm gonna go through this super quickly because you've seen it, but I go through, I get my, um, my repo, I create the project, uh, make sure that uh, it's been synchronized, uh, and then I've got that, uh, the project. Now I associate it uh, with the inventory, which is just my database server. Again, y'all have been through this, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on to it. Define the inventory group, add the machine to it, which is host 120, uh, and once I have the inventory defined, then I can go and create the template which again, it's just another YAML, it's just another playbook that I uh, checked in to get. Uh, so I go in, define it, associate it with the database servers. Now right now there's only one, but you know, I could, I could uh, adjust that inventory to be 10 or whatever. Um, check the box again to make sure that we're doing privilege escalation. And once that happens, I run it, it goes out, it installs the MariaDB server, uh, it, starts the server, it opens up port 3306, and it even runs a little shell script where it reads a SQL file so that it creates the WordPress database, uh, creates the database user, like all that kind of good stuff. Uh, and that brings us to what I would say is kind of the minimum you need to understand just to get familiar with AWX. As I said, if you do the Red Hat Online Learning for this, uh, I think it's like a 48 hour class or something like that. So, you know, clearly I can't cover anywhere near all of that in here, but I just wanted to give you a resource so that if you wanna play around with this, that you can, okay? So let's do this. What does this look like in real life? And you gotta love live demos. So. Is this the real life, or is it just fantasy? Let's do this. Uh, let me bring up my web browser, and this is going to be a challenge because I'm going to have to do my web browser like on your screen, 
Hang on just a second. Or, actually, what I could do is, let me see if I can just mirror this. Give me just a second, y'all. So, let's go to settings. Let's go to display. Let me change this so I'm mirroring. This may get ugly. Stand by. Give it just a second. All right. Can you see? Yes, you can. All right, cool. So, as a just kind of a, a what's going on, um, I'm going to fire up a couple of shells. Give me just a second. So, let me make this a little bit larger so y'all can see it. There we go. And I'm going to do two of them. So, I'm going to do SSH uh, host 120. And then I'm going to do SSH to host 183. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop this over to another desktop, and we'll come back to it because this will kind of make sense in a second. On that other desktop, I'm just going to do while true do PSAX. And I'm going to leave those running because we're going to pop back over to this in just a second. All right, so we're just doing a, a process listing over here. I'm going to pop over to here. I'm going to log into my AWX instance. And like I said, let me make this a little bit larger so you can see it. Can you all see that okay? I'm doing okay, cool. All right, so again, I'm going to go into uh, my templates um, I have set up my inventories. This is my inventories for uh, inventory for the uh, database servers and the web servers. Uh, I've created projects for the Apache installation and the MariaDB installation, and I've created templates for each one of those. So let's say that we want to install MariaDB. Now, I only have this defined on one machine, but again, you can run this on as many machines as your system can uh, support. So I'm going to go into MariaDB, scroll down a little bit, and this is how difficult this is. So I'm going to fire up that, and I'm going to pop over to here to host 120, and you'll see in just a second, because it's just doing a loop of all of the commands. It should, hold on. I love live demos. Why? Hang on just a second. That is obviously not happening. Hold on just a second. Let me cancel that. Did I, let me make sure I didn't like screw up my project. Let me make sure I have network connectivity. So let me do the MariaDB installation. Let me sync this and make sure that I've got connectivity. Okay, that worked. Let me try this again. Templates, install MariaDB, launch. Come on, you got to be kidding me. What's that? Uh, in, oh, there it goes. Okay, it took a second. <laughs> this is why live demos are always like, all right, cool. So, but you can see, and I'm going to pop back over to here, and ah, there you go. You can see that you've got a bunch of processes running in here. A bunch of stuff gets uh, fired up, and after a few seconds, hold on, where is, oh, I saw it. There we go. MariaDB is running on that machine. And on that machine, because I did um, run a uh, SQL script on it, uh, so let me do this. I'll do MySQL, uh, select star from MySQL.user, and, ooh, look at that. There is the user. Hold on just a second. Right there. So I defined the correct user from the correct machine, so WP admin from that machine, and so... I can go back over to the UI, and I can see that it completed successfully, 
and no errors, no nothing like that. So if I go over to my web browser and I go to host, oh, no wait, never mind, that's the database server. There's no web server on there. Um, let me do the other one then. So now that we got MariaDB running, I can go back over here to my template. Now I can do the install Apache command. Click on launch. Pop back over here to this machine. And hopefully, there we go. See how it just changed and you can see a whole bunch of uh, jobs being run on the back end. And in just a second, what it'll do is it will have the web server and the PHP service running. And uh, hopefully, yep, there we go. So I got PHP FPM and I've got Apache HTTPD. And hopefully if I come back over here and I look at my output, boom, there we go, no errors there. So if I go to host 120 dot virtual dot LAN, Oh, come on. Host120.virtual.lan. Slash. There we go. Oh, I'm sorry. It's 183. 120 is the database server. Sorry, guys. Let's do the right thing. 183.virtual.lan. There we go. So now the web server's up. It's working. And if I go to uh, WordPress WP Admin, check it out. It's already got the database connection to the machine on the back end because I deployed the wp-config.php file that had the right database connectors using Ansible. So now... You just saw that I set up a database server and a, a front-end web server. This could have been load balancers. This could have, I mean, it could have been anything, right? The caveat that I have is when you deploy your machines, whether they're VMs on, you know, VMware or on KVM or on EC2 or whatever, just make sure that you've set up your SSH key. And the beautiful thing about it is once that happens, once you've got that SSH key, Obviously, you have to be smart about setting up your firewall rules so that no one can SSH into your environment if it's out in the public, except from your, in, uh, you know, your, your machine. Uh, so, oh my gosh, I'm over, guys. I apologize. I'm way over. Uh, so, this would be Q&A, uh, but I got people over there that are kind of glaring at me. So, d was this helpful? Yeah. Did this talk y'all through it okay? Because I tell y'all what. I beat my head against the wall forever to make this work. Uh, so hopefully this is helpful. I apologize. I'm like, I, I, I thought I still had about 10 minutes left. So um, again, let me do this. Let me pop over to, hold on. There we go. Uh, so again, if you have any questions, catch me afterwards. Um, my contact information, like I said, is up there. You are welcome to reach out to me. I don't claim to be like the best, you know, playbook author, but the, on the infrastructure side, this stuff I know relatively well. So thank you very much. I appreciate it and have a great rest of your weekend.